Hey everybody, I'm here with Ivan the Heathen again for a third installment on a prehistory and history of liberalism. So last time we went over uh, kind of liberalism proper when it cohered as a concrete uh, ideology that you could point to with a certain set of influential thinkers. Obviously, Locke comes to mind um, as kind of the, the archetype of the classical liberal. Uh, we went through some uh, more marginal thinkers, some little-known uh, French theorists, uh, the economic arguments and influences that came out, some of uh, some obscure uh, Spanish, uh, what do you call them, scholastics? The, the late scholastics, yeah. Yes, yeah. So we went through all sorts of very interesting things in that last discussion. I would highly recommend you watch that before you watch this, we're trying to get a, a nice big picture understanding of what is this phenomenon? What is liberalism? What's happened to it? And now we'll be looking at what happens with liberalism in the 20th century. So we referenced at the end of the last video, uh, the fact that a certain uh, set of socialist thinkers, including John Stuart Mill, assumed the title of, of liberal thinkers and basically covertly uh, propagated socialist thought in the guise of liberalism. And that was one of the factors that led to the demise of liberalism in the early 20th century. So just to give a brief outline, we're going to be covering that phenomenon, the death of liberalism, how Fabian socialists and others, uh, you know, kind of muddied the waters. And today we still see the impacts of that with the very ill-defined concepts of liberalism in the general public. Most people don't know what liberalism actually is. They think it's like the left or something very vague. Um, and then we'll move into a discussion of various anarchist uh, thinkers that lingered around and had some influence. And then the Austrian economists. Um, then we'll probably look at the post-war scene, neoliberalism, and then some contemporary theorists to round it out. And hopefully that'll put us in a position where uh, we both have well, ma mainly I'm leeching off of Ivan's knowledge here, but we'll both have a pretty decent understanding of where we're standing with this whole philosophy of liberalism. And then next time uh, Ivan and I can have the cage match that I've been waiting for, the NAP will be su temporarily suspended and we'll go at it. But for now, uh, 20th century liberalism. So how does liberalism die and why? And what are some of those influences that uh, kind of sh changed the trajectory of liberal thought in the early 20th century. Well, that was a marvelous introduction as usual. Um, now then, um, at the uh, as we approach the turn of the 20th century, sort of the, the final decades of the 19th century, moving into the 20th, industrialization has taken off. Um, living standards are rising in a way, at least in, in Europe and in the West, uh, in a way that was has been unprecedented for all of human history. And this has an enormous number of effects. I mean, for, throughout the 19th century, the liberals, uh, the original kind of classical liberals, as I call them, achieved a number of significant political victories, the most serious of which was probably the repeal of the Corn Laws in England. Uh, the Corn Laws were a series of um, sort of import restrictions, I guess you could say, on uh, on grain and on wheat and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, grain and wheat were basic staples for the peasantry, for the poor. And if England was not uh, able to import these, then you know, obviously uh, people like that be in a very precarious position. They'd be one uh, famine or one bad crop away from starvation. And I believe it was in 1845 that this finally happened and uh, you know, devastation uh, occurred. And finally, in reaction to it, uh, the following year in 1846, the Corn Laws were repealed. So in this way, um, throughout much of the uh, 19th century, liberalism seemed to be in the ascendant. But at the same time, other things were happening. You mentioned, of course, uh, John Stuart Mill and his covert adoption of the mantle of liberalism as a way of propagating uh, socialist ideas, which was an especially uh, effective tactic, especially in the English-speaking world, because Anglophone countries tend to uh, 
um, look down upon the word socialist, but if you present those ideas to them in another guise, they're, they're not necessarily as, as repelled by that. Um, but in addition to all that, you of course had actual socialist movements start to, start to uh, emerge and rise up. And uh, the other important thing was that uh, was World War One, frankly. Um, you know, it was the the major event that sort of heralded the the um, emergence of the the twentieth uh, century proper and the exit of the world that liberalism had created. Um, so, so one major problem was the eventual onset of World War One. Uh, there was also the fact that around the um, the turn of the twentieth century, many of the important classical liberal thinkers had died, and there was basically no one left to. Uh, replaced them. So let me just go down the roster a little bit to give you an idea of how devastating this was. In 1902, Lord Acton dies. In 1903, Herbert Spencer dies. In 1906, Aubron Herbert, who was a major follower of um, Herbert Spencer, in fact was an anarchist, um, uh, although he didn't use that term, he called himself a voluntarist. In 1906, Aubron Herbert dies. Also in 1906, Eugen Richter, um, probably the main uh, German liberal of the 19th century, he dies. And I'll discuss briefly uh, the events in Germany because they're important for what follows. Um, in 1910, William Graham Sumner dies. And Sumner was uh, the first sociology professor in the United States. He taught at Yale and uh, was a, a major classical liberal. Just to quickly give you an idea of some of his important works, uh, he, he um, delivered a very important speech called the Conquest of the United States by Spain. And this is something he delivered in reaction to the Spanish-American War. Um, and his point in that speech was that though the United States had easily won the war against Spain, the imperial spirit as represented by Spain had actually won out over the you know, Republican, Democratic, uh, supposedly free, uh, freedom-loving spirit that was supposed to or was intended to prevail in the United States. And so he kind of ended the speech with uh, foreboding that um, the United States was sort of on the path to, to empire. And that proved, of course, all too true. So in night, um, that was that was one of his major works. He wrote a short book also called um, What the Social Classes Owe to Each Other. And it's a basic kind of, you know, classical liberal take on social relations, um, making the point common among many classical liberals that uh, the long run social and economic interests of all the various classes of society are ultimately in harmony and that interventions by the state um, in favor of one group or against another or made an attempt in an attempt to uh, impose some obligations on one group to another group tend to, you know, throw this harmony out of balance and so forth. So that, that gives you sort of a basic um, outline of what he was all about. So in 1910, William Graham Sumner dies. Then in 1912, Gustave de Molinari, who I mentioned in the last installment, um, a, you know, wonderful, uh, maybe the first anarcho-capitalist, but also a longtime editor of the Journal des Economistes, which is the major, uh, not not really not only the major economics journal in in Europe at the time, but sort of the main source of uh, of where uh, much uh, classical liberal thought throughout the 19th century was was published. I mean, virtually anyone who was anyone wrote there, Bastiat, Pareto. I mean, you you name it. But in 1912, as I say, um, Gustave de Molinari dies, and it's it's very interesting because his final book, um, he which was published uh, the year before his death, he complains that he feels something in the air and that it seems as if Western civilization is about to go to hell, that there's just some tension in the air and so it feels like something's about to go wrong, that all hell is about to break loose at any moment. And of course, a few short years later, we had the outbreak of World War One. Also, in 1914, Eugen von Bombawerk, the major Austrian school economist, who I'll discuss in more detail later, uh, he commits suicide, allegedly in despair over the outbreak of World War I, because he too believes that Western civilization as a result of that war is basically finished. So you have this situation where the leading lights of classical liberalism have all died, and there's essentially no one to replace them. I mean, there, there is Ludwig von Mises, and I, I don't mean to diminish him. He's extremely significant. But for a while, it was only Mises. He was alone virtually throughout the 20s, the 1920s. So 
most of the representatives of classical liberalism die off. And as I say, they're, they're replaced by this covert socialist strain, which cloaks itself in, in the language and the terminology of liberalism that was started by Mill. So in addition to Mill, you have um, people like L.T. Hobhouse, for example. Uh, and he was um, a kind of neo-Hegelian English philosopher and also a disciple of Mill's who wrote in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and basically had a kind of Hegelian sort of organicist conception of the state. Um, and that organicist conception, of course, brings back a lot of the, the thinking about the state that one tended to see in, um, in medieval and in classical thought, basically comparing the state to uh, an organism with, you know, parts that are organized in a certain way that, you know, allegedly have to have some kind of harmony between them. Um, so he had this organicist conception of the state and also um, assisted Mill in his co-option of liberalism by basically making more or less the following argument. That yes, at one time, there was an old liberalism, the liberalism of the minimal state, the liberalism devoted to preserving the freedom of speech, property rights, uh, freedom of religion and those things. And in its own day, he says, yes, this, this was important. This was meaningful. And by the way, this, this uh, statement that in its own day, classical liberalism had a function. This is, this is Tobhouse taking over that kind of Saint-Simonian aspect of, of Mill's own thinking, you know, that, that, um, various doctrines and ideological movements that appear in whatever historical epochs they appear, they have their particular historically local function, but that once history passes further, they come to be superseded. So he takes this up and says, yes, there was an old liberalism, but, uh, but now there is a new liberalism. And a new liberalism is necessary because industrial, uh, industrialization has made society far more complex, uh, far more difficult to manage. And therefore, a vigorous state action is necessary in order to assist the individual in achieving his self-development and you know, in, to allow him to you know, fully uh, flower and develop to the greatest possible extent that he can. Uh, in addition to Hobhouse, of course, there was uh, John Dewey, the, the American uh, philosopher who had more or less had the same, the same kind of line except that uh, in reaction to those like Mill and Hobhouse starting to take over the term, uh, the term liberal, the actual liberals, the, the people like Auburn Herbert or, and you know, others like him, they, they had no choice but to change what they, uh, what they called themselves. So they started to call themselves individualists. But before long, that term came to be co-opted. And so Dewey, uh, much like Hobhouse uh, shortly before him, started to say, yes, there was an old individualism, but now the new individualism requires the marshalling of all the forces of society to assist the individual in his self-development and, and so forth and so on. Um, so this is in, in a sort of general way, the kind of development that was going on. More specifically, uh, something very important happened in Germany. Um, basically what I'm referring to here is the way in which Otto von Bismarck uh, broke the back of German liberalism and through an alliance with socialist parties, forged the modern welfare state. The, the German model of the welfare state that was then created essentially spread throughout the Western world. Um, so basically what, what happened is you had, you had three major parties, broadly speaking, within German politics in the sort of late uh, 19th century. In, in Bismarck's time. You had the sort of conservative faction that Bismarck represented. You had the general kind of the genuine liberal wing, um, which was represented mainly by Eugen Richter, whom I mentioned uh, briefly not long ago. And then you had socialists uh, like Ferdinand LaSalle and others like that. And um, although Bismarck did perceive a threat from the socialists, because of, of their ability to sort of marshal mass resentment. Um, he ultimately felt more threatened by the liberals because the liberals wanted to reduce uh, and to minimize state power. 
Whereas the socialists obviously didn't have any problem with aggrandizing the state. And so Bismarck saw himself as ultimately having more in common with the socialists. And so he reached across the aisle, forged an alliance with them, and used that alliance to basically, as I say, break the back of German liberalism, inaugurate the welfare state, and basically buy off the masses and uh, offer them you know, uh, welfare payouts, welfare checks in order to keep them from protesting, striking, uh, engaging in revolutionary activity like that, which uh, went on during 18, you know, in 1848 and so on. So he, Bismarck basically created the welfare state. That model spread. Um, and um, yeah, so and, and all these factors sort of combined uh, really just kind of wiped out uh, the, the classical strain of liberalism. So again, to repeat, uh, most of the major liberal thinkers uh, died around the turn of the 19th century and no one replaced them. Um, you had Bismarck uh, unify Germany and create the welfare state and, and sort of uh, basically, basically not only buy off the masses, but also um, and this is one of the reasons why he, he ultimately forged this alliance with the socialists. He saw that living standards were improving as a result of industrialization, and he feared that if things got too nice, if the masses became too wealthy and too comfortable, they would draw the conclusion that they didn't need the state, that they didn't need their, their political leaders. And Bismarck wanted to undo that and forge ties of interest between the political class and the masses. It was sort of a, the central uh, motivator for his decision there. So there was that, and that model spread. And then lastly, there was, of course, World War I and the massive kind of mobilizations uh, that uh, went along with the war, the collectivization of, of the economy, um, the, the state planning that, that was ushered in as a result of the war. And then sort of more peripherally, you had in general kind of socialist and then there's also nationalistic and fascistic movements going on. And these came to sort of attract attention. Uh, so, yeah, just all combined, this uh, this kind of smashed uh, the, the original kind of liberal school until, as I say, for, for a significant period during the 20th century, the only major liberal in all of Europe was Ludwig von Mises. Right, OK. So two questions. Uh, one, what's going on in economic thought in the background here? Um, obviously, the Austrian school is taking off at this time. Is classical liberalism still a prevalent economic philosophy, even if uh, in terms of political philosophy, it sees a sudden de uh, decline? And then the other, all of these deaths right in a row of these prominent thinkers is it pure coincidence or I don't know, is Hillary Clinton involved? You know, what, what's going on there? I don't know, man. I mean, some of these, some of these, these deaths do have rather bizarre circumstances surrounding them. I mean, no one is quite sure uh, how uh, Eugen von Bombavirk died. The, the usual story is that, as I say, he committed suicide in, in despair over the outbreak of World War One. Um, but, you know, no one's really totally sure. Um, as, as far as uh, what's going on in economics, well, just to give sort of the background before the Austrian school emerges, um, usually it's, it is, it's been thought up until pretty recently by historians of economic thought that throughout the early to mid 19th century, basically Ricardianism dominated English economics. And very briefly, um, it's also kind of an interesting story about Ricardian economics and, and how much of it was actually thought up by Ricardo himself rather than, than James Mill. But the basic thrust of Ricardianism is that it's kind of a, it's a crusade against the land, the landlord class, um, it, really. Um, basically, Ricardo's view was that land rents are a differential between uh, the the most productive land and the least productive kind of marginal land. So rent is derived from that kind of differential in productivity. And and therefore he thought that because that that's what determines rent, he then combined that with a kind of Malthusian um, iron law of wages idea. The iron law of wages is basically this, that, um, that oh, there's a natural level of, of wages for workers. And if... Um, capitalists or workers, uh, employers begin paying them a higher wage than that, then this will um, 
this will enable workers to breed to a greater extent. The population will rise. And then as a result of the fact that there are now more mouths to feed, living standards will drop again. And of course, if they drop too low, um, then labor begins to decrease and it becomes more scarce and that bids wages back up. So there's this allegedly natural tendency, this, this is claimed by the iron law of wages, to keep the wage rate at sort of the, the level of bare subsistence. So Ricardo combined this idea of, um, of how land rent is determined with the iron law of wages to basically say that as society industrializes and uh, capital accumulation increases and economies become more productive, basically populations will, will, the population will increase and that will then require more and more land to be brought into cultivation so that uh, this increasing population can be fed. As more and more land is brought into cultivation, um, more and more marginal land comes to be used of necessity. And so the differential between the most productive and, and least productive land increases. And so land rents tend to increase. And therefore also as a result of rising productivity, you have um, an increase in the share of um, of productivity um, given over to labor because he also Ricardo also believed in the labor theory of value. So basically you have this situation according to Ricardo where the share of the um, the economic product consumed by the landlord class and by laborers is increasing and the capitalist class is being squeezed out. And so to prevent this Ricardo kind of uh, advocated enormous taxes to be placed on land. This is sort of the stuff that that's that's partly what's associated with Ricardo and the other major idea uh, associated with Ricardo is comparative advantage. But it's not clear that Ricardo actually thought this idea up. It, it's probably true that this was James Mill's idea because at the time James Mill, John Stuart Mill's father and Ricardo were kind of deeply associated with one another, basically went on walks together pretty much every day, uh, talked all the time. And James Mill, who was a man of just boundless energy, just a, a, a busy body of like infinite, indefatigable, just will to do things all the time. And uh, as he talked to Ricardo, he began, you know, nagging him and pestering him to write a book on economics. Uh, finally, Ricardo <laughs> did it, sent Mill the manuscript, and Mill made all sorts of co uh, corrections and changes to it and said, no, don't say this, say that. Um, and, uh, and one of the things he included was this idea of comparative advantage. Um, and this is normally applied to international trade, but really is sort of more broadly applicable to um, economic coordination uh, more generally. Basically, it's the idea that if you have two countries, A and B, um, even if um, A is superior to B in every industry, it is nevertheless mutually beneficial for A and B to trade with one another because even if we assume that A is superior in its productive capacity in every area to B, it's not necessarily superior to the same degree in all of those areas. And so it would still be beneficial for B to specialize in the areas where the, the differential between A and B is the, the lowest, where the where A superiority is is the is um you know the the least uh, the, the least. So yeah, so this is probably Mill's idea. So the, uh, most historians of economic thought, as I say, uh, basically thought that um, basically said that uh, 19th century economics, starting in the early 19th century and going down to about uh, 1871, which is when the marginal revolution happened and the Austrian school came on the scene. Uh, most historians of economic thought have said that Ricardianism dominated English economics. This turns out actually not to be true, according to some, some more recent work. Um, you had some pretty uh, trenchant criticisms of um, Ricardo come from the likes of people like Nassau Sr. and, and uh, John Ray. People are scarcely remembered today. But there was this whole, this whole kind of thing going on in English economics, and it sort of served as the background to the eventual uh, emergence or eventual discovery of the law of diminishing marginal utility. And this was discovered independently by three people. One of them was an Englishman, William Stanley Jevons, who was not an economist by training. I think he was a philosopher, a philosopher, a philosophy professor. Um, he was he was one of the co-discoverers. Uh, the other was uh, Leon Walras in Switzerland, who had a very kind of mathematical approach to the whole question, which eventually came to dominate uh, neoclassical economics. And then the third person was Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school. So marginalism was discovered 
more or less independently by these three people. And uh, the law of diminishing marginal utility is basically the idea that as you add additional units of a good, um, you know, as, as you give a, a person additional units of a good, the utility that the person derives from, from each additional unit tends to diminish. So, you know, if, if you're broke, you know, a few dollars can be extremely valuable to you, but if you've got a billion dollars in the bank, you know, who cares if you have an, an extra few bucks, basically that that's sort of the basic idea. Um, and this was uh, this was adopted in in different ways by all three of these different thinkers. Now Jevons uh, was not able to do very much with it because he died young, but as I say, um, Walra had a very mathematical approach, and that came to dominate the neoclassical school. But Menger uh, was completely different in that he used no mathematics at all, and that he engaged in a kind of um, a philosophical uh, philosophical analysis of individual action. Um, he had a, a very causal realist approach to, to economic phenomena. Basically, for Menger, the, the thing to, to keep in mind is, you know, the individual actor on the market who has ends that he wants to achieve and basically pursues various means to achieve them. The idea being, you know, methodological individualism, that the market is a collection of individuals who act together and through their actions and through their expectations and so forth, produce whatever it is that happens to emerge on the market. In addition to this, uh, there came the law, um, the the idea that utility is subjective. Now, of course, this idea wasn't uh, invented by the Austrians, and it existed among quite a few of the late Spanish scholastics uh, before them. But basically what Menger did is he revived this old uh, continental economic tradition and kind of counterposed it against the, the British tradition started by Smith and then moved forward by Ricardo, which had the labor theory of value at its center. So Menger revives the these Spanish scholastics and the uh, French economists that I mentioned, people like uh, Turgot and, and um, Condillac and so on. So he revives them and... Um, it proceeds to sort of develop his analysis further. Uh, one of Menger's main contributions was uh, his description of the origin of money. And he, he described money as kind of emerging on the market via a, a natural process wherein um, people trading on the market run into the problems inherent to barter. Um, you know, if, if you, for example, have eggs and want to trade them for a sandwich, uh, you not only have to find someone who has a sandwich and you have to find someone who has a sandwich and is willing to trade it for eggs and so on. So there's this double coincidence of wants problem. And under a barter economy, therefore, you're sort of significantly restricted in the amount of uh, exchanges you can engage in, and this places enormous limits on the possibilities of economic development. So to get around this problem, you need uh, a something to serve as a medium of exchange, as a money. And what Menger basically showed is that um, money can emerge naturally through a kind of emergent process where the most saleable commodity on the market um, is accepted because of its saleability and comes to be accepted not as a result of whatever intrinsic properties or value it may hold uh, in and of itself, but merely on account of its saleability. And so that then kind of gradually tends to evolve into money. So you have this kind of monetary analysis coming out of the Austrian school as well. Uh, a bit further down, um, Menger's great hey, student. One, one second, uh, one second. Let me ask. So I'm just having a thought about this. It's an interesting okay. subject. So it seems like money is connected with a, a minimum in diminishing marginal utility. Is that accurate to say? A minute. Uh, okay. What, uh, what What do you mean in, by, by well, saying? So like diminishing marginal utility, you you eat the first sandwich. That's a lot of utility. The second, third, diminishing returns. Right. But money, because of its saleability, it no matter you can keep on getting that money, and it doesn't have dimin the fact that people want to buy it. Uh, and the fact that it's exchangeable for other things mean there's there's not really diminishing marginal utility when it mm -hmm. comes to money. Would that be what distinct one way to distinguish money as a commodity from other things that do have diminishing utility? Mm -hmm. 
Well, no, because the the analysis that I'm describing just takes a, a given quantity of of money and and uses it that way. It 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 doesn't act, it doesn't necessarily make any point about you know how each additional unit of money will be will be received. Um, this is kind of the the larger saleability of it is a general property of it. So that that doesn't. Uh, I'm tr I'm trying to see why you would think that this. Um, is a counterexample to the to diminishing marginal utility. Like no, no, there still would be. It's just Sorry? not that it would be a counterexample to it. But my, I'm looking for a definitional feature of money that it is a commodity with minimum diminishing marginal utility. Be, just from the individual actor's perspective, that's maybe I misconstrued the way you're talking about diminishing marginal utility. But it seems like most most goods you only want so much of. Money is the one good that basically can continue stacking up and it's going to be convertible into some kind of utility for you um, ad infinitum. So well, no, it seems the, like it. Oh, it, it. If it seemed that way, I, I apologize. I wasn't trying to give that impression. Uh, okay, okay. It, should it, I try it, to explain it, this it, again? Not for people. Um, I, I was just trying to connect that diminishing marginal utility. Uh, with the a, a theory a monetary like a theory of money and how those two might be connected i'm not trying to comment on uh you know what those, you're saying those uh, things will be connected later but that's when mises comes into the picture so okay, there well, will we, be a connection but not not that one okay <laughs> okay um so so anyway so yeah so basically you have um menger giving this kind of causal realist uh you know, praxeological analysis of, of market action based on, you know, basic principles, basic ideas about individual action and so forth. And then also introducing this idea of the, the, the natural kind of spontaneous emergence of money. Um, following him, uh, you had uh, his student Eugen von von Bawerk, whose main innovations in Austrian theory uh, for, um, basically relate to capital theory. He basically founded uh, Austrian theory, and he's usually thought of as being the originator of the idea of time preference, although he wasn't. The, the real originator of that was Turgot, and it's kind of an unfortunate fact, which is that um, among some of Bombaverk's uh, private papers, uh, there were there found a few um, unpublished writings where he acknowledges Turgot as one of his predecessors, but he never admitted this in public and, and never sort of gave him due credit, kind of an unfortunate thing. But basically what, uh, what Bombaverk did uh, first is he, he wrote a book called Capital and Interest, and the purpose of that book was to demolish all pre-existing uh, capital theories. And we don't need to go into all of them. It would take us uh, much too far afield, but I'll give you some sort of like representative examples. Like th the main theory, the most popular one at the time was the uh, kind of not, what you might call a naive productivity theory. So b basically what Bombaverk was trying to do was to explain the phenomenon of interest, but also more broadly to explain why it is that capitalists earn an income on the market, even though they don't quote unquote do anything. Um, so basically, the naive productivity theory more or less holds this, that um, capital enables you to earn a return because it is productive. So, for example, uh, you buy a tractor, let's say, and the tractor costs, I, I don't know how much a tractor costs, let's say it costs $100,000. But you're able to use the tractor to help you produce, um, let's say, $11,000 worth of crops every year, and the tractor has a life of 10 years before it breaks down. And so in total, you can produce $100,000 worth of goods, but you only pay, sorry, $110,000 worth of goods, but you only pay $100,000 for the tractor. So $10,000 profit, 10% profit. So he, he wants to explain why that happens. The naive productivity theory says, well, it happens because the tractor is a productive asset. You can use it to help you produce things. And Bombavik's criticism of this is basically like, yes, it's perfectly true that the tractor is a productive asset, but this doesn't really explain the problem because if the tractor is a productive asset, why is it that its product, its future expected productivity is not already factored into its present price? That is, why does the tractor cost $100,000? 
only $100,000 rather than $110,000, even though people expect it to be able to generate $110,000 of productivity. There's no, the, the naive theory doesn't explain that differential. Um, the other more significant uh, criticism that he makes is of the Marxist uh, exploitation theory. Um, and just give kind of a brief overview of classical uh, Marxist economics. Marx starts out with the labor theory of value and says that basically, um, you know, that uh, all goods derive their, their market value or their, their exchange value from the socially necessary labor time required to produce them. And this also includes labor itself. So what determines the wage rate on the market according to Marx? Well, it's the socially necessary labor time required to produce the laborer, i.e. whatever the cost is of all the you know, food and the calories that he needs to sustain himself and maybe also to sort of sustain his family at a kind of bare subsistence level. Marx is not totally clear about this. But, um, but so he, he, he explains the wage rate that way. However, because labor is the ultimate determinant of value, the laborer is the source of all of the economic value of whatever it is that he produces while he's at work for the capitalist. But because the capitalist buys labor power and as it were only pays for labor, that is he pays the, the minimum wage rate that the, the worker needs to sustain himself rather than the full product of whatever the worker produces, the differential is uh, he calls it exploitation, and this, according to Marx, is the source of capitalist profit. And Bombavik's uh, criticism of this, basically, is to introduce the notion of time preference. He says, you can explain this phenomenon perfectly well without any reference to exploitation. Um, and what you have to understand in order to explain it is that the capitalist and the workers have different, um, different time preference scales. So time preference is the idea that um, future goods are discounted as against present goods, that present goods, me merely because they are present goods and can be enjoyed in the present, are all else being equal, more valuable than future goods, because you have to, you have to wait for a certain period in the future before you can enjoy those future goods. So um, let's say uh, a given quantity, like what would you rather have? Would you rather have $1,000 now or would you rather have $1,000 a year um, a year from now? I mean, most people would, would say, give me the thousand now. So the, the fact that the thousand is a, is a present good carries a premium over it. However, to, to get someone to make the opposite choice, to prefer the future good, and therefore to engage in the kind of capital investment that would be necessary to develop an economy, um, you need to provide some sort of return that would overcome this, um, you know, this uh, this time preference uh, um, differential. And this is basically the source of interest. So, in other words, um, if I if I were to, if you need a loan, let's say, in order for me to agree to lend you money, it's not enough merely that you make sure that I recoup my principal, because for the duration of the loan, I don't have access to the money that I've lent to you. So in order for me to forego that satisfaction, I need something in addition to it to make the exchange worthwhile from my end. That's the source of interest. And it's ultimately also the source of all capitalist profit. So basically, the, the gist of it is, Bombavik says, uh, workers have, they're, they're more present oriented. That is, they're willing to accept a smaller proportion of the total uh, value product of what they produce, but, but uh, in the present, as, exchange, as, um, as distinguished from the capitalist who is willing to wait and you know, defer his income to not have any income at all, sometimes even for years, in order to reap the, the greater and fuller product. The capitalist also has to adopt risk and the workers do not. And it's this differential that explains it. So for example, let's say the capitalist starts a factory and there's some roundabout production process and it takes, um, I don't know, a couple of years before the final product is ready to go to market. Well, you have to pay workers you know, wages every, you know, every two weeks or so, even though they're not actually selling anything because the production process isn't complete. So the capitalist foregoes any income for that duration until the product can go to market. But when it does go to market, he reaps the, the full effect of it, whereas the worker wants to be paid sooner and is willing to accept less payment in exchange. 
So there, so that's ultimately his explanation. And um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's sort of more or less Bon Bavirk's main contributions. Um, that sort of gives you the the beginning of the Austrian school. Uh, then we go into Mises, and there's there's quite a lot to to talk about when it comes to Mises' contributions to economics because he made an enormous number of them. Um, his first book um, on the subject uh, was published in 1912. It's called The Theory of Money and Credit, and um, basically what he does is he integrates money into the already existing kind of general Austrian analysis. It had been acknowledged uh, by this point that the price of goods on the market is determined by the um, jostling of supply and demand. And Mises basically applies this same idea to money and says, well, there's a given supply of money and a given demand for money, and that determines its, its value also. But what he also does is he 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 solves a problem that had been nagging economists up to that point, which is this: um, at any given time, there's a certain array of prices that exist on the market. How do we explain that particular array, and why does that particular array exist rather than some other? Now, Menger and uh, some of Mises' other predecessors had basically come up with a theory of the emergence of money, but they haven't they hadn't quite managed to put everything together to explain the particular array of prices that happens to prevail. And this is where um, Mises' idea of the uh, monetary regression theorem comes in. So let let me see if I can explain this correctly. Um, Mises basically says, okay, let's take some given array of, of money prices. What determines those money prices? What determines uh, the value of of money and the the cash balances that people hold and so on? Well, part of what determines that is the expectation that people have that their money will continue to hold purchasing power into the future. So they expect to be able to buy goods in the future. And this is one of the factors that gives money its present value. Because again, this notion of time preference also coming into the analysis here. And... So basically, you can kind of you can kind of revert things and sort of go backwards. So the way Mises describes it is, let's take a unit of time, and this is an arbitrary unit of time, but he calls it a day. And what he means by a day isn't actually a 24-hour day. It's just however long it takes for some particular array of prices to be established. So on one particular day, you have some given array of prices, and one of the factors in the establishment of that array is the array of the previous day. And what what established that previous day's array is the array of the day previous to that, and so on. And so you have this kind of regression going backwards. Of course, the problem he runs into is, isn't this an infinite regress? And Mises ultimately says, well, no, it isn't, because um, you can you can explain, as Menger did, the emergence of money um, from a uh, uh, kind of you know general commodity on the market that sort of evolved out of barter because it was the most saleable, and so he has he has this fully integrated theory of money now, um, and you know explains money prices and explains its functioning in terms of uh, the law of marginal utility in terms of subjective value like he's got the whole thing. Uh, a little bit later, he begins to develop um, the Austrian uh, business cycle theory, and uh, he he has a few. He has a few places that he draws from as uh, inspiration. One of them is an economist named Knut Wicksell, a kind of Swedish-Austrian who did work on interest theory. And uh, basically what he pointed out is that if the market, if the rate of interest is pushed by the government to a level below its market clearing level, this uh, this tends to create a massive uh, infusion of credit into the economy. Uh, basic, basically, if the government pushes the interest rate down below its market level, it becomes more attractive to borrow money. And so naturally, more people borrow money. Uh, and as they do, more credit floods into the system. Uh, banks create more credit and so forth. So he takes that idea. And he also takes a kind of uh, primitive, I guess you'd say, kind of monetary theory um, where that uh, Ricardo came up with, but when Ricardo talked about it, he was uh, he was trying to discuss sort of international exchange, and Mises perceived that you could sort of tweak this a bit and have it be applicable to business cycles. So basically, what what Ricardo uh, 
realized, uh, let's see if I remember this right, but basically um, when you have, uh, when you have credit booms, those, uh, the, the credit tends to go into specific areas. It's not just sort of generally evenly distributed. It tends to go into specific business enterprises, into specific areas, um, sometimes to people who, you know, happen to be connected to the political class or whoever it is that happens to be generating the new money. And those people tend to use it uh, however they happen to use it, whether that be business investment, speculation, and so forth. But when the credit spigot is turned off, when the supply of credits uh, falls, you get um, especially severe downturns, especially severe crashes in those areas where the, the original credit during the boom flowed the most heavily. So Mises basically combines this and he generates Austrian business cycle theory. And the basic idea here is that the rate of interest, um, because it's ultimately determined by the, the social rate of time preference, that is the degree to which uh, people in society as a whole tend to prefer present goods to future goods, um, that tends to sort of give an indicator for capitalists, for businessmen, for investors of the time structure of, of um, you know, people's, uh, people's spending habits and their sort of consumption horizons and so forth. And that gives them an indication of what sorts of uh, production processes it is or is not profitable to undertake. And so if things function as they should, um, they, uh, entrepreneurs will then use the signal given by the interest rate to determine what sorts of projects to engage in and what sorts of projects to not engage in. But when the government manipulates interest rates and let's say puts, pushes them down artificially, this gives entrepreneurs the signal that credit is in fact more abundant than it really is. And that leads them to think that consumers are more willing to save and less willing to consume than in fact they are. And so responding to this signal, they tend to engage in more roundabout production processes. The problem, however, is that these relatively roundabout production processes, which may be extremely productive after a, a long enough time has passed, nevertheless are not in sync with uh, actual consumers' consumption preferences. And when this is revealed and it becomes clear that um, – Either consumers don't want to pay for whatever it is that entrepreneurs ultimately put out on the market or when it becomes when this is revealed just by the fact that the amount of money that entrepreneurs need in order to keep investing in their production processes dries up. Well, then you have a, a, an explosion of business failures and you have this phenomenon of um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs who normally you would expect would be selected for on the market to make good forecasting decisions, suddenly making forecasting mistakes en masse. And th this is how Mises explains this kind of central fe feature of uh, economic downturns, that uh, th this is a result of, a, of, a manip of manipulation of the interest rate and therefore the sending out of a false signal and uh, entrepreneurs act on the basis of that false signal and they make bad decisions about how to allocate their resources across time. So that's that's basically the gist of um, what Mises was doing economically. I mean, I could also mention the calculation argument, um, but this is this sort of ties into to socialism. I don't know if you want me to go into that. Do you want me to? Uh, yeah, we might as well hit that. Uh, briefly, and then we'll head into any uh, kind of miscellaneous anarchist thinkers or like holdovers from classical liberal thought in terms of politics. Okay. Uh, then kind of move forward in the century from there. Okay. Basically, in 1921 or 19, 1920, I'm sorry, uh, Mises published a very important article uh, called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And uh, with this article, he sort of built upon his previous theories to try and show why uh, socialistic uh, central planning could never work. And the basic idea is this. Uh, the, the key element of all forms of socialism, whatever the disagreements that may exist between various uh, kinds of socialism, is that they all agree that um, – private property and the means of production is to be abolished. But if private property, the means of production is abolished, then there can be no exchanges 
um, made with those means of production. If there can be no exchanges of means of production, then it is not possible to have market prices emerge for the means of production. Market prices emerge as a result of the jostling of supply and demand, and this can only be revealed through actual exchanges on a market. So if there are no exchanges, because exchanges are prohibited, you can't have those market prices emerge. And of course, market prices are not arbitrary. They're actually a reflection of, you know, of um, the degree of supply and demand on the market for whatever good you happen to be concerned with. Not only that, but differences in relative prices between the various factors of production are also important because when an entrepreneur thinks about how to produce a certain good, he normally has a, a significant number of options available to him. And so he must decide between those options. And normally on a market, the signals given to him by relative prices tend to indicate to him which procedure or which process is the most profitable. Um, and where it is best for him to, to take resources out of, how to combine those resources and so forth. But if you have no private property in the means of production, no market exchanges in the means of production, and no market prices in the means of production, then none of this information exists. And so when a socialist planning board attempts to allocate resources and determine how much steel to produce or how much wheat to grow or whatever it is, it simply doesn't know how to act. It doesn't know which production processes to engage in. And so you, you as a result, get all these kind of weird features of socialist uh, economies. I mean, for example, uh, the, the, it was actually very common in the Soviet Union for um, petite women to not be able to find clothes that fit them properly. All the clothes were uh, you know, far too large for them. Why, is this, why was this the case? Well, it's because the, the planning bureau went to the clothing manufacturers and gave them quotas denominated in terms of, you know, feet of cloth or a certain weight or, you know, kind of physical units of, of whatever cloth was being used in, the, in the, whatever clothes were being manufactured. And so to hit that quota more easily, they just, um, they just produced clothes in large sizes. And so, you know, petite women, for example, couldn't find anything that fit them. You had a similar issue with uh, roofing nails, for example, which tend to be quite small. Uh, the planning bureau would say that you have to produce a certain tonnage of nails and so the factories would produce very large nails in order to more easily meet that quota and therefore you'd have a shortage of small roofing nails you'd get problems like this so basically what Mises pointed out is that without private property in the means of production without market prices it's not possible to coordinate production intertemporally and so the socialist planning board is sort of flying blind I want to I want to pause very briefly to make kind of an important distinction which is that there's the original Misesian formulation of the argument, and then there's the Hayekian formulation of it, which is slightly different. Uh, the Hayekian formulation from Friedrich Hayek that comes a bit later basically expresses the argument in this way. It says, well, there's a certain amount of information that is necessary to to carry on production processes and to sort of intertemporally coordinate resources and all this stuff. But this requires so much information that no central uh, organization, no central planning board could possibly compute or crunch or analyze all of it. And so you have this information overload and the, the bureau is not able to coordinate production uh, effectively, whereas in a decentralized market system, you're able to sort of more efficiently and effectively distribute that information. M many people regard these as basically the same argument, and they're not. Uh, the crucial difference is that in the Hayekian formulation where things are expressed in terms of information, you could at least in principle make the counter argument that with a sufficiently advanced computer, with enough computing power, with efficient enough algorithms, it could at least in principle be possible to crunch all of this information. There are reasons in computational complexity theory why I don't think you can do this, but we don't need to go into that. Let's assume for the sake of argument that there's some level of computing power that could be reached where this would be possible. Um, 
if you take the Hayekian formulation, then the reply that, well, we just need advanced stuff, con uh, computers, and then we can handle everything, that becomes a valid response. It is not, however, a valid response to the Musesian formulation, because precisely the point of the Musesian formulation is that the market prices that entrepreneurs use to coordinate production, when there are market prices and the means of production, those things serve as the input for what your hypothetical computer algorithm would have to use in this case. See, when you have your input, then yes, it's true that the coordination problem is just an optimization problem, and therefore it's something that in principle a computer could solve. But Mises' point is that if you don't have private property in the means of production, you can't generate the relevant market prices in the first place. So there is no input to put into your algorithm. And if you can't generate input for your algorithm, then it doesn't matter how advanced your computer is. It doesn't matter how powerful your algorithms are. That's sort of, I mean, I don't know. I think that's an important difference right. that a lot of people miss. Yeah, it's interesting. So the calculation problem for Hayek uh, comes down to insufficient processing. For Mises, it comes down to insufficient information in the first place. Well, yeah, it basically comes down to the fact that there's no, there's no input to use. There's no determinate input in your algorithm. Nice distinction. Okay, so uh, Mises and uh, Hayek innovate in the Austrian school in terms of economic thought. Are there any other um, Austrian economists that you want to mention that make a, a big impact within economics itself before we look at some other uh, anarchist political thought around that time? Well, um, when Mises converted Hayek to his position um, in, the, in the 1920s in Vienna, uh, after um, after uh, uh, the Nazis rose to power and sort of chased out Mises, Hayek, and a whole bunch of uh, German uh, intellectuals out of Germany and Austria, Hayek wound up at the London School of Economics and became quite influential there and converted a number of uh, later uh, significant uh, Austrians. Uh, these are people like uh, Lionel Robbins, for example, was a major one, uh, Gottfried Haberler. Uh, Mises also went to America and at, at that point, he taught a seminar at NYU where he ran into people like Hans Senholtz, um, George Reisman, uh, Ralph Rako, and then eventually Murray Rothbard. Um, now, as far as Rothbard's innovations in economic thought go, um, he was originally commissioned to write a book that sort of simplified uh, Mises' book, Human Action, for a, a mass audience. Um, Human Action is you know, sort of uh, Mises' main work where he kind of synthesizes all of his uh, economic insights and puts them together in one place. So Rothbard was originally commissioned to sort of simplify this for a mass audience, but as he started working on it, the book grew and grew and expanded further and further, and eventually he, he got to the point where he began making his own uh, original contributions to economic theory, and the book evolved into something it wasn't meant to be. And his main original contribution is in monopoly monopoly theory. So Mises in human action basically says like, yes, it's technically possible for monopolies to emerge on the free market. And Rothbard counters by saying, no, it is not. And in fact, if a, if a monopolistic firm ever did emerge, it would actually face the Misesian calculation problem. Because having totally monopolized the industry, there are no other competitors and there, there, there are no market interactions that could generate uh, relevant prices that the firm would have to work with. And so it would, it would basically be in the position of a, of a socialist planning board. And therefore, even if it attained this state, it would be unstable and it would swiftly lose it. Uh, the interesting thing, too, is after Rothbard published this and someone asked Mises, you know, what do you think about this? You know, Rothbard disagrees with you. And he basically said that Rothbard was right. That uh, So that was sort of his major innovation in economics. Um, and, you know, that that more or less describes uh, the gist of uh, development in, in technical economics in the Austrian school throughout the 20th century. Um, you wanted to move to political thought next. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so I don't have specific philosophers in mind, but just who is around that's advocating forms of volunteerism, anarchist outside of like a purely economic sphere in uh, say the 10s, 20s, 30s, 
Well, well, Mises again. I mean, in Europe, he was basically alone as being the only major uh, representative of classical liberalism. Uh, in in 1922, he wrote his uh, his book Socialism, which expanded on the uh, arguments that he provided in that original article that I mentioned, and sort of gave a more comprehensive critique of socialism. Uh, after that, he wrote a book called Critique of Interventionism, and by interventionism, he meant the the mixed economy, the idea that uh, you know the government, while not monopolizing ownership over the means of production would nevertheless regulate the capitalist market. And what he showed in this book is that basically interventionism is an unstable system. So basically the government does something, it intervenes in the market. This disrupts the market's functioning and creates some sort of problem. The people then react to that problem and then call for another intervention in the market. And then another intervention happens and that second intervention causes another problem which then creates the alleged necessity for a third intervention and so on and so on. And eventually a point is reached where either, either things creep all the way toward full socialism or the interventions are simply undone and we uh, revert to a free market. So let me give a specific example of this. Uh, let's say that uh, you know people start complaining that uh, certain workers do not receive sufficiently high wage rates on the market. And so there starts, there comes to be agitation in favor of a minimum wage. Okay, let's say that the minimum wage is implemented. Well, whatever minimum wage is chosen, there are going to be certain sub-marginal workers that are going to be unemployed as a result of that. They're not going to be able to find work on the market. And uh, as a result of their not being able to find work, there will then come to be a clamor for the government to deliver unemployment insurance to these unfortunates. And that will then provide the stimulus for the next intervention and so on and so on like that. So that's his critique of the mixed economy. And then Mises basically says, well, given that these two systems are either unstable or outright dysfunctional, the only alternative is sort of free market uh, liberalism. And he comes to advocate that in, in a book he writes in 1927 called Liberalism, where he basically sets out the, the kind of general classical liberal program. Uh, you know, private property rights, especially private property rights, he puts a very strong emphasis on this. There's a, a passage in the book where he basically says, if you want to sum up the liberal program in, in one word, it would be this, private property. And he goes on to also talk about... Um, you know, peace and international relations and all these other things. Um, why, for example, it is important that uh, free tr international uh, free trade be preserved. He says that protectionist barriers tend to um, uh, provide reasons for nations to engage in war because they're being excluded from certain markets and therefore being, you know, in impoverished as a result of that. And so in order to secure that market, you you, you go to war. Uh, this actually ended up being confirmed quite starkly uh, when uh, as a result of the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariffs that were implemented in the United States in the 1920s um, and basically led the, the Japanese, among others, to begin a, an imperial policy in order to secure markets for themselves. Um, so, so that's basically what Mises does. And as I say, he's basically alone among Europeans. Uh, now, over in America, things are a bit different. And here I'm going to be going back a bit chronologically. Uh, in, in America, you have this... Um, this kind of individualist uh, anarchist tradition sort of emerge. And the individualist anarchists, the American anarchists are, they're different from the European anarchists that existed at the time. Uh, among the Europeans, you had people like uh, like Proudhon, like Bakunin. These are people that um, I was I was a bit interested in in, in my teenage years. Um, so I, I might discuss them, but then again, this might take us a bit uh, too far afield. But anyway, um, I'll just start with some examples. The first major uh, figure among the uh, among American anarchists is um, a guy named Josiah Warren, an interesting character, by the way. He was uh, an inventor, uh, an or an orchestra conductor, uh, just just an interesting guy all around. But um, um, when he was um, he he married very young. He married when he was twenty, and then shortly thereafter, as a result of his tinkering with um, various mechanical devices. He uh, was able to f uh, discover a new method for um, uh, heating, what was it, heating lard, to a new lamp to heat lard and generate electricity that was more efficient than the pre-existing uh, tallow method. He patented that, immediately started a factory, and became quite well off. 
but then uh, two years later, Robert Owen was a, a British socialist. He was part of the group of socialists that are now called the Utopian uh, socialists. Um, although this is a term of derision invented by by Marx and Engels uh, to sort of um, cast people's attention away from these people because in many ways they were sort of embarrassing to the socialist cause. But in any event, um, in 1825, Robert Owen arrives in the United States and tries to form a utopian community called um, uh, at, in the um, southern tip of Indiana. Um, and uh, things seem to go well at first for a little while, but shortly, shortly thereafter, everything collapses and uh, it just utter disaster revol- results. Basically, um, as long as Owen was not there to personally supervise activities and sort of coordinate things with his own personal charisma, things immediately fell apart and would not work properly. And uh, so Warren kind of emerges out of the ashes of this community and starts wondering, okay, what went wrong? And he draws the conclusion that things went wrong because this socialistic experiment um, submerged the individual excessively. And so as a result, he becomes a kind of individualist. And um, he then, you know, formulates this idea. And really, in, in metaphysics, he becomes almost a nominalist, I would say. He, he insists that individuals are sort of absolutely unique and absolutely different, down to the point that the, each individual's peculiar use of language is individual and particular to him and cannot be fully understood by anyone else. This is not really a coherent position, if you ask me. I mean, if if what Warren says here is correct, one wonders what reason anyone would have to read his work or what reasonable expectation anyone might have of understanding his work if they chose to read it. But in any event, he, he says this, and he uses this to, to make the point that formal constitutions, therefore, cannot be relied upon to preserve individual liberty because they will always be uh, reinterpreted or misinterpreted by lawyers, by various self-interested political actors. And so any constitutional limits on state power that might be created by a written constitution will always inevitably be eventually eroded. And he comes to the conclusion, therefore, that formal constitutions are useless and that, therefore, the only way to um, meaningfully restrict state power is to not have a state at all. Uh, and becomes an anarchist in that way. Now, in his economic views, he's he also gets tied into the labor theory of value, although this is maybe forgivable for him because, you know, he's writing before the Austrians. Um, but he engages in a number of very kind of interesting schemes. He was famous for a store that he opened up. It was called a time store. And basically, um, a customer would walk into a store, search for whatever it was he needed, and, and then maybe go to him for assistance. And as soon as a customer went up to him for assistance, Warren would start a, a timer so that he would have a record of how much uh, time was spent on uh, providing the customer with assistance. Uh, the, the customer would then be made to sign a, a voucher or a ticket and say, I was provided with such and such an amount of time of assistance. I agree to provide to you in return when you call for it a certain amount of time of uh, of work of whatever kind that the customer in question was able to to do. So if it was a customer, it would be a certain number of minutes or hours of, of carpentry work, et cetera. And he created he tried to create a kind of exchange system on this basis. Uh, so that's that's Josiah Warren. Um, interesting guy, I guess. Um, following him, the, the next major important American anarchist is Lysander Spooner. And Spooner is interesting to me personally because he's the first anarchist I ever encountered. Um, and basically, uh, Spooner uh, starts with a very commonsensical, kind of simple, natural law conception of justice, which is that justice is to give each man his due, his proper due. And he goes from this to draw the conclusion that no government is justified and not only that no government is justified, but that it is not even possible to set up a government by way of contract. So he, he has a whole um, long 
essay called uh, No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority, where he analyzes the Constitution and social contract theory in general and comes to the conclusion that um, no government can ever be uh, justified by contract. And he makes a number of, of interesting points, uh, one of them being that if the Constitution purports to be a contract, the only people which it can bind are those which were then alive at the time when the document was signed and which actually signed the document. Now, that is a minuscule minority of the total population. And in any event, the signing of the Constitution took place 80 years before Spooner was writing. And so he makes the point, well, all those who signed the Constitution or who, who were around for its signing, even if they could be said to have been bound by the Constitution, they're all dead now. So how can people who were not even alive at the signing of a contract be said to be bound by a contract? This is absurd to him. And he makes points along this vein, you know, and so on. That's basically a gen general overview of um, Spooner. The other major American anarchist probably would be Benjamin Tucker. And um, he was a student at MIT. And uh, I believe it was... Um, this was in, uh, I, th I think, the... Uh, I think around 17... Uh, sorry, 1870. Uh, he he meets Josiah Warren. Uh, Warren goes there to sort of give a speech on his ideas, and uh, Tucker is entranced, and uh, you know eventually kind of becomes an anarchist for the remainder of his life. Uh, now initially he has a kind of natural rights position. He believes in a kind of natural law and that the state, by virtue of not being able to uphold this law or because it violates it. Uh, therefore can't be justified. But eventually, later in life, he becomes a Sternerite. So a brief digression on Max Stirner. Uh, Max Stirner was a German thinker, um, and he he basically is every, he's the embodiment of every bad stereotype that people have about anarchists. Basically, that they're totally opposed to social cooperation, that they're kind of raw, rugged individualists who want nothing to do with other people. This is not true of any major anarchist thinker at all, except for maybe Stirner. And Stirner had this very radical nominalistic conception of the individual. Um, and because of that, this led him to reject basically all concepts, all universals, everything. Uh, the only thing that was real for him was the individual. And so he began to, he rejected all ideas and all abstractions as kind of artificial reifications, including, by the way, the idea of freedom itself. Um, he then also had this uh, paradoxical notion of what he called the, the union of egoists, um, basically these, these kind of radically deracinated individuals who happen from time to time to associate with one another for personal convenience or pleasure, but who can break off their association at any moment they feel like. So um, basically, Tucker became a Sternerite eventually. Um, he, he was also interesting in that he moved to New York later and opened up a bookstore, which published a lot of important anarchist literature. He was the first person to translate Proudhon into English, the first person to translate Bakunin into English, and kind of introduced all of these other um, sort of left-wing anarcho-communist or quasi-anarcho-communist thinkers to, to America. And he founded a journal called Liberty, which um, was very important for um, the great number of debates that it, it fostered. I mean, vir virtually everybody who wrote for this journal disagreed with everybody else. And there was a ton of debating and exploration of sort of anarchist arcana there. Um, so that, that basically um, is a, a very rough description of um, the American scene. Another thinker I want to mention very briefly, um, I brought him up earlier, but I'll, I'll discuss him in some more detail, is Aubron Herbert. Uh, he was a follower of Herbert Spencer, who basically took Herbert Spencer's doctrines to an extreme. He was an Englishman, by the way. Um, and uh, I remember reading his work for the first time when I was about 19 and being very, very impressed by it. He has a collection of essays called The Right and Wrong of Compulsion by the State. And the one thing uh, about his work that particularly jumped out at me was the point that he made that um, if the state is abolished or just excluded from commercial life, uh, this tends slowly and gradually to promote the improvement of, of morality among the people. And the reason for this, he says, is that if all interactions are purely voluntary, if everything is if everything happens within that nexus, 
then in order for anyone to achieve much of anything, he has to take into account the desires and the wishes of other people. And because he has to take these things into account, he's therefore induced to behave in a more sociable, uh, a more kind of broadly, you might say, civilized manner. And so, so the diminution of the state and its eventual uh, disappearance tends to promote an, a gradual improvement in morals. Conversely, Herbert said, um, the rise of the state or its growth or, or its uh, spreading of its tentacles into more and more aspects of human life tends to diminish uh, general morality. Uh, if, a, if a social problem of some consequence emerges, if you have a vast state in existence, people will tend to offload the responsibility to deal with that problem onto the state. Um, and so they won't take personal responsibility for it. They won't take personal uh, initiative in handling the problem. They won't try to come up with any kind of creative solutions. They won't personally donate any of their money. Um, they'll be less likely to do these kind of personal things to help out with whatever's wrong. And we'll simply say, oh, we'll vote for a law or we'll vote for a, a policy and we'll deal with it that way. So there's this kind of promotion of the idea of the offloading of one's uh, moral responsibilities to one's fellow men. Uh, also, the state, uh, Herbert pointed out, tends to atomize people for precisely the same reason, because people sort of offload their social responsibilities onto the state. Now, as I say, when I first encountered this, it, it kind of impressed me. I thought this was a very uh, profound point. Uh, but I later found out that uh, Herbert did not come up with this notion himself. He, he took it from Herbert Spencer. Uh, although Spencer was not an anarchist, I, I think I mentioned briefly in the last installment of this that... Um, he uh, Spencer, at least in Herbert Spencer, uh, at least in the early editions of his major kind of work in political philosophy called social statics, included a chapter called the right to ignore the state, which he basically said that um, if you are a man who is living peacefully in society and you're not violating anyone's rights and you just sort of decide that you don't feel like paying taxes to the state and that you can handle uh, protecting yourself uh, perfectly well, or if you think you can make arrangements with others for mutual protection, well, then uh, that's fine. That's acceptable. And you, therefore, he said, have the right to ignore the state, which functionally resorts in a, it results in a kind of anarchism, even though uh, Herbert Spencer didn't go that far. Uh, later editions of the, uh, of the book remove that chapter. But uh, I guess people like Auburn Herbert and then uh, later others like uh, Wordsworth Donisthorpe, who I just briefly encountered as I was kind of preparing for this. Um, unfortunately, I don't know much about his thought, except that he, in broad terms, is sort of similar to Auburn Herbert. He's sort of a Spencerian uh, anarchist. But this this chapter had a, a great influence on his sort of more radical followers. Um, and I guess out of everyone that I've described so far, uh, Auburn Herbert is the guy who's, uh, or, or maybe I guess Auburn Herbert and Gustav de Molinari are the two thinkers who are sort of closest to my own personal political philosophy. Uh, so that sort of describes the kind of anarchist trends at from the, the 19th into the 20th century. All right, very nice. So uh, we get into World War One. World War II, people are busy, I'm assuming. Um, there's not too many uh, intellectual figures that come out of that time generally compared to like the early 1900s or the uh, post-war period. So let's take a look at that post-war period and the rise of neoliberalism. This is one of those confounding factors that makes it difficult to... Uh, for people today to come up with a coherent definition of liberalism. So what are the origins of neoliberalism? Is it, would you classify that as uh, involved in this kind of Fabian socialist strategy? Um, just another tool of the kind of technocratic, progressive, uh, scientific elite who had been trying to move society in a new direction since the days of uh, St. Simone? Or uh, what, what do we call neoliberalism? What does it come from? Well, uh, basically, I think you more or less have it right. Um, one of the reasons I agreed to do this series with you is that there's, um, I've noticed a, a strain of thinking among a good number of people on the distant right 
which basically holds that uh, classical liberalism, the more kind of libertarian aspects of it, more or less naturally evolved into modern liberalism and into socialism. And I wanted to go through all of this history to show that that's not true, that these are in fact distinct traditions and that the 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 evolution that we in fact did see historically came about as a result of people like Mill adopting the the name of liberal but actually using it to propound uh, socialist ideas. So yes, I, I would definitely include the, the Fabians there. Uh, but before I mention the Fabians, there's one other there's one other thinker who's kind of important and he comes to the fore um, at around sort of like around World War One or around the turn of the 20th century and then has an enormous influence on post-war liberalism. And that is Edward Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein is the founder of what is called revisionist Marxism or revisionist socialism. Basically, um, Marx's view was that uh, capitalists would over time as capitalism developed, proceed to squeeze more and more surplus value out of workers. And as they squeezed more and more surplus value out of the proletarian class, that proletarian class would be driven into misery. Its living standards would gradually plummet and it would eventually be driven to revolt, thus overthrowing capitalism. Well, by the turn of the 20th century, it was abundantly clear that this simply was not happening. Uh, not only were the proletarians not uniting in the kind of uh, sort of class conscious uh, interest that classical Marxists wanted them to, their living standards were improving noticeably and they were starting to become, you know, quite comfortable. Uh, not only that, but when World War I broke out, um, rather than coming together on the basis of their shared, uh, their allegedly shared uh, economic interest as a class, uh, the proletarians uh, fell in line with their respective countries. They defended their nations in the war and they, they jumped into the conflagration that was World War I. And this, all of these things were very difficult for Marxists to grapple with. And so as a result of all this came revisionist socialism. And basically what Bernstein said is, okay, the, the grand sort of violent uh, socialist revolution where we overthrow um, overthrow capitalism in this kind of magnificent uh, way, that's probably not going to happen. But we can gradually uh, bring about the existence of socialism through things like labor unions, through uh, the welfare state and so on. And his general view of things tended to dovetail very nicely with that of the, the Fabian socialists, obviously uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb. Um, and then later, I guess you could you could mention um, uh, Aldous Huxley and, and people like that. Also, John Maynard Keynes, who was friends with the Webbs. I mean, the, the Webbs in particular um, began to exert their influence because they wrote a book about the Soviet Union. And this was sort of the, the early period of the Soviet Union where virtually all of uh, the intellectuals of Europe were enamored with the Soviet Union and came to see it as, you know, the wave of the future. And they, they wrote um, they wrote a book sort of describing it and basically whitewashing all of its uh, all of the Soviet Union's crimes, all of the gulags. It was, it was pretty, pretty horrific how. Uh, how they how blatantly they lied about this. And by the way, I should mention they were able to write this book because they were invited into the Soviet Union and, of course, you know, shown only the, the nice parts by the authorities. But Keynes, in turn, who had also been to the Soviet Union and who was familiar with the more brutal side of the Soviet system because he had witnessed it. Nevertheless, in his review of the book, which proved to be enormously influential, did not mention this. Uh, you know, that that's simply not an honest way to operate. Or if he did mention it, he sort of he, he tended to downplay it like, yes, you know, there are some there's some rough, violent, uh, regrettable aspects to the Soviet Union. But this this isn't really to be to be uh, handed down to the debit of socialism. It's just a, a regrettable aspect of the brutal Russian character or something like that. That was how he more or less explained it away. So. So you had uh, the general run of intellectuals in Europe kind of enamored of socialism and the, the currents from people like Bernstein and the Webbs and the other uh, Fabians were sort of taking over general intellectual life and kind of uh, found their way into the air of the university in general until eventually um, 
this kind of quasi-socialism, this kind of welfarist uh, statism that we see now associated with uh, what is today called liberalism, just became part of the air. It just became part of the atmosphere. And that was uh, more or less how things were. And that became sort of the dominant uh, thread of, of thinking within, uh, within the West. Right, right. Okay. So uh, there are some, you know, modern liberal theorists who are prominent who come to mind that deserve to be mentioned on the Austrian side of things, uh, the more classical liberal, but with some, you know, innovations and interesting ideas, Hans Hermann Hoppe. And then as far as mainstream uh, liberal currents go, the number one guy is uh, John Rawls. So would you like to address, I mean, we should talk about those two. Who else in you know the last few decades really stands out either as an authentic um, you know, liberal theorist uh, politically or as, I guess, one of these covert socialists that deserve uh, to be outed? Well, if we're going to discuss Rawls, we also have to discuss Robert Nozick um, and his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And he was, he was basically a libertarian. Um, so I would I would definitely put him in the authentic uh, liberal camp, although he was he was very idiosyncratic. Uh, and anyone who reads that book immediately sees just what an extremely labyrinthian mind the guy had. It's a very clever guy, a lot of digressions and bizarre thought experiments. Very interesting book. But if we're going to discuss Rawls, we definitely need to discuss uh, Nozick's criticism of Rawls. And then uh, you did mention Hans Hermann Hoppe, the, the sort of as one of the sort of Austrian affiliated, um, you know, genuine sort of liberal thinkers. Obviously, Murray Rothbard also has to be mentioned as sort of a major influence on Hoppe. But that's that's who we should discuss. Um, also, I, I guess we could briefly talk about Hayek's uh, political work. I mean, there there is um, there is that that book that he wrote, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, and also has, has thoughts on spontaneous order. So let me try to. Uh, spontaneously impose some order on this and uh, and sort of um, start out this discussion. Let's let's start off with Rawls. Um, OK, so John Rawls basically uh, outlines a political system in his uh, main work, A Theory of Justice, which is based around like two broad principles of justice. One is the first is that people within your political community should be guaranteed certain political rights. And he he enumerates them like, uh, you know, freedom of speech, uh, a free, you know, sort of freedom of religion, these kind of like basic, uh, basic liberal things. But one thing that he does not include conspicuously is private property. This is kind of a major source of why he's not part of the authentic original tr tradition of liberalism. And the other major principle is what he calls his difference principle. And this is basically the idea that economic inequalities within society are only to be tolerated insofar as those equalities somehow redound to the benefit of whoever happens to be the least well off. So for example, um, if you have a particularly talented uh, industrialist or capitalist or who's you know able to you know, do things to run a massive business and generate a, an, an enormous amount of wealth, uh, he will, of course, individually become very wealthy as a result of this, and that will generate enormous inequalities. But his, uh, his work, his behavior will also have ripple effects on society as a whole and will tend to increase social wealth. And so if, if we have to allow him to have more wealth than most people would have in order to give him the proper inducement to turn his talents to the benefit of society, Rawls considers that uh, that acceptable. Um, now, there's there's a couple things about this, which is that the concrete application of this, the difference principle really depends on what views you have of economics. And the the odd thing, and a number of um, of libertarian and Austrian critics of Rawls have pointed this out. If you basically accept um, 
kind of standard Austrian free market theory and you believe that the long run economic interests of all uh, economic classes are basically in harmony and that the state is merely a, a mechanism for wealth redistribution rather than creation, then the consequence of the difference principle is that you should you should not have a state that interferes in the economy at all. Now that's not um, that's not Rawls's actual position, obviously. But the point is that if you it's when combined with a certain view of economics, you can actually draw that conclusion from the difference principle, which is kind of an odd problem with it. Um, there's also uh, another problem with Rawls' formulation. One of um, one of the framing devices for his theory of justice is what he calls his original uh, position thought experiment, and uh, basically it, it works like this. He says, well. Um, how are we to work out what the proper uh, principles of justice are by which to organize our society? Well, we have to abstract away from all things which are arbitrary from a moral point of view. And so he creates a thought experiment in which we're to imagine that we do not know anything about the station that we are to occupy in society. We do not know anything about our natural endowments, our physical abilities, our intelligence, um, what religious group we're a part of, essentially nothing. We're, we're to imagine ourselves as these kind of um, disembodied ethereal wraiths. And so he asked, well, what sorts of principles would we arrive at in this state, given that we don't know anything about our, our own position in society? Well, if we don't know anything about what position we're to occupy in society, then uh, presumably, we would want uh, the society to be organized according to principles that are not, uh, you know, excessively cruel to the least well off, because after all, we might end up in that class. Uh, and he sort of goes through this kind of stuff. And this is how he arrives at those those two uh, principles that I mentioned earlier. Now, one of the problems with this is that when when Rawls talks about what he considers to be arbitrary from a moral point of view, you can essentially you know, include anything in this. It's not just what particular level of wealth you happen to hold, but it's also your temperament, uh, your intellectual abilities, you know, and anything that kind of results from your biology, which he considers to be more or less arbitrary and a, a product of choice. But if that's arbitrary, well, then you you have basically limitless justification to carry on as much redistribution as you want. And this is one of the criticisms that Nozick uh, makes of Rawls in Anarchy, State, and Utopia. Um, he makes the point that, you know, for example, um, do you deserve your kidneys? Are you in some abstract um, sense of justice? Are you entitled to both of your functional kidneys? After all, you could only live with one of them. And there are people out there uh, who have no functional kidneys at all. So would it be right to strap you to a table against your will and cut out one of your kidneys to save one of these people? Well, you know, intuitively, there seems to be something very wrong with that. And Nozick just says, well, you have to, at some point, you have to just say, look, people have rights, people have rights to property. And um, we, we simply can't uh, allow considerations of, of what's quote unquote just to, to come into the picture that these rights, as he, as Nozick conceives of them, act as, uh, as, he, as he puts it, the term he uses is side constraints on what sorts of ways we can sort of manipulate society to achieve whatever just outcomes we want to achieve. Um, uh, Nozick makes the distinction between what he calls historical principles of justice and end state principles. And end state principles are basically concerned with an outcome. Um, basically, um, let's say you have some conception of wealth distribution that you would like to see in society. And that is kind of your, your, um, your North star, as if you will, for um, how you want to organize society. What matters to you is the end state. What matters to you is the particular result that's achieved, the particular distribution. On the other hand, if you subscribe to historical principles of justice, that it's not important to you what the results of a particular process are, it's only important that certain rules are adhered to. So if you, so a libertarian like Nozick uh, would certainly uh, subscribe to a historical principle of justice. So uh, for example, on the market, 
people exchange things to which they have property titles. And if you trace back the history of these exchanges, eventually you'll get to a point where, you know, some resource was originally appropriated or homesteaded. And then from that point on, it was it was it changed hands through a series of voluntary exchanges. And for Nozick, the important thing is that those particular rules are followed. Now, what distribution happens to result from following those rules is just not important to him. Um, and one reason why it's not important to him, this comes to one of his famous thought experiments, the famous uh, Will Chamberlain example, is that if you want to focus on uh, on end state principles of justice, inevitably to achieve those things, you will have to engage in a significant amount of coercion. So he sets up the thought experiment this way. Imagine a society in which in the beginning, all wealth is perfectly equalized. You have a totally egalitarian distribution of wealth. Let's just say uh, everyone has one dollar, right? Now, Will Chamberlain decides to play basketball. And because he's Will Chamberlain, some people want to watch him play basketball. And he says, fine, if you want to watch me play basketball, you have to pay me 25 cents. And one million people agree to do this. Well, so what happens now? Will Chamberlain now has $250,000. And you have enormous inequality introduced into society on the basis of this. Now, if you want to avoid this kind of radical inequality, um, you have to employ significant coercion to prevent this. So either you can't allow Chamberlain to charge people to watch him play basketball, or you can't allow people to watch Will Chamberlain play basketball or something like this. The point is none of these... Um, None of these solutions are particularly palatable. And so Nozick says, well, to avoid these kind of consequences, we have to focus on principles of justice that are, are historical, on, on impersonal processes, rather than direct notions of direct outcomes. Uh, so that's sort of his criticism of Rawls. Uh, he, he also makes uh, criticisms of Marx and criticisms of uh, Murray Rothbard and anarcho-capitalism and other parts of the book, but I, I don't know if you want me to go into that. Um, his, his arguments are, as I say, pretty, pretty labyrinthine. Uh, I, I guess I'll pass over from Nozick and, and go to Hayek. Um, Hayek is important uh, as a student of Mises, and I mentioned earlier that he introduced a kind of alternative formulation of the, the Misesian uh, calculation argument. But flowing out of this, uh, a very important notion for Hayek was the idea that um, societies are emergent systems and that there's a kind of spontaneous order that happens as a result of people interacting within the framework of rules given by libertarianism. So basically you have certain simple rules. Um, unowned property can be appropriated and then comes to be owned by the, the first appropriator. And then subsequently after that, um, any legitimate transfer of ownership has to occur via some voluntary exchange. So you so if you frame your society according to those rules, there's a vast number of possible results you can have, and they're totally unpredictable. You get this emergent order out of it. And uh, yeah, so what Hayek says is that because of the inherent complexity of the system, um, you actually can't plan it. There's just too much information for a central planner to process. And so he sort of makes the, the opposite point to the point made earlier by the likes of John Dewey and L.T. Hobhouse that the complexification of society as a result of, industri of the Industrial Revolution requires state planning in order to keep things from you know, going crazy and going off the rails. Hayek says just the opposite. No, the complexity of society is precisely why we, we shouldn't have state intervention. It's precisely why we do need these kind of decentralized networks to, to manage this kind of stuff. That's one important aspect of his thought. The other thing I should highlight is, um, is his critique of the notion of social justice. And basically what it amounts to is this, and he, he says this in the second volume of his work, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. This... Um, this process of, of the market, this spontaneous order, it's an impersonal process. It's not the result of anyone's will or anyone's desire. No one person specifically wills some particular income distribution to happen as a result of the market process. It just, it just happens. No, no one wills it. It's impersonal. However, Hayek says, if we wish to speak of justice, 
justice is an individual matter. In other words, it's a matter of me doing right by someone else, me fulfilling my obligations. If I take someone's property, it is just for me to return it to them or to compensate them appropriately and so forth. And so therefore, because justice is this kind of personal and individual matter, for Hayek, it does not make sense to even apply the notion of justice to an impersonal process like the market. And so for him, the, the very concept of social justice is kind of meaningless. And it's just used as a weasel word to get people to accept uh, growth in state power and you know growth in, in state influence. Um, there are other things about Hayek. I mean, he's, he's far from a consistent libertarian. He makes um, all sorts of compromises. Um, he, especially in his book, The Constitution of Liberty, which Murray Rothbard wrote a scathing review of, he called it an evil book. And I quote, this is an evil book. And, you know, as I say, Hayek makes all sorts of compromises. He's in favor of like national parks and minimum wage laws and even conscription into the military in some cases. Um, you know, so from a pure libertarian perspective, this is not uh, this is not good. But nevertheless, you know, Hayek has some some interesting contributions to make. Okay, the next person to discuss is uh, Murray Rothbard. I have discussed briefly some of his uh, contributions to technical economics, but uh, in the realm of political philosophy, he diverges totally from Mises, who was his mentor. Mises is basically a utilitarian, um, and he says, well. Econ Mises said that uh, economics is a is a technical discipline. It's a scientific discipline, and he holds to the Humean distinction between you know uh, values and and matters of fact. So Mises says economics can tell you what the results of a particular policy will be, but in itself it cannot tell you whether one should pursue that policy or not. All Mises says is that most people, in fact, desire to live in a prosperous society. And so given this, one therefore should adopt free market policies. Uh, he, he really doesn't go any further than that. For Rothbard, this is inadequate. He's He was just in general a, critique, a critic of uh, utilitarianism, you know, and he, he brought up like various paradoxes and problems with pure utilitarianism, like uh, some wacky thought experiments here too, like, uh, the idea of a utility monster. Um, this is a monster who goes around murdering people and who derives so much pleasure from murdering people, so much utility, that his increase in utility is greater than the decrease in utility that, that falls upon those who are murdered. And so, you know, from a utilitarian perspective, this would seem to be justifiable. Now, I understand there are later versions of ut utilitarianism that sort of adopt a, a rules framework, a kind of rules rule-based utilitarianism that, that avoids these problems. But the point is Rothbard made these kind of criticisms of pure utilitarianism and instead adopted a natural rights approach. And he engaged in some pretty significant uh, research into the history of thought into the late Spanish scholastics, um, sort of Protestant quasi-scholastics like Hugo Grotius, a lot of the people that we discussed in earlier installments of this, and was able to devise a kind of natural rights uh, system. And uh, basically what it amounted to was this. Uh, he took self-ownership as an axiom and then said, well, given that each person owns himself and given that uh, we occupy a certain reality which has a given structure, that there's a certain empirical reality which is structured in a certain way, in order for us to make the fullest use of our capacities, we must make use of the uh, physical resources of the world, and therefore we need some sort of property system to allow us to determine who may use what, when, and under what circumstances. And he, you know, he basically sets out the the rules of that property system. If some um, some resource is um, unowned, it starts out as unowned and then can be homesteaded by someone, by the, the kind of original appropriator. And this is an interesting thing, this idea that uh, resources can be unowned, because in, in most thought previous to this, um, sort of a, a general resource like that, like land that hadn't been brought into cultivation, most people uh, in, in Western political thought did not regard this as an unowned resource. They regarded it, they regarded it as something uh, uh, like a common resource, that it might be brought into individual use. The only exception to this, the only major exception that I know 
to this prior to Rothbard is actually Immanuel Kant. He said the same thing, that resources are unowned rather than held in common. But so basically the first rule that Rothbard kind of adopts is that unowned resources can be homesteaded. And then after that, property titles can be you know, exchanged via voluntary transactions. And he spins out a whole kind of libertarian system of, of rights. And his major work on this is the ethics of liberty. And I mean, there's any number of applications to this we could go into. Uh, just one um, interesting one that occurs to me is um, how he would deal with the problem of pollution. Um, for Rothbard, the problem is dealt with by you know specifying who owns what. If I own a factory and I dump chemical waste into a lake, well, you know, it, if I if you own the lake, then I am violating your property rights by doing that. And so I I owe you compensation or I can be, you know, justly prevented from continuing to dump that waste into your lake. Um, so, and he kind of uses this as a response to critics of free market capitalism, which uh, allege that um, that uh, free market capitalism basically allows, uh, you know, large industrial concerns to sort of destroy and despoil the environment. And Rothbard makes the point that under a genuine libertarian framework, this wouldn't be allowed. The reason why it has historically been allowed is that large, uh, large firms, large capitalists have managed to capture the state and use its legal and regulatory apparatus to essentially violate the property rights of other people when it was convenient for them to violate them. So, you know, um, a chemical plant wants to dump uh, waste into a lake and some little old lady lives by the lake and she says, hey, you're, you're violating my property rights. Well, uh, under a libertarian system, you know, the little old lady would be given consideration and it would indeed, you know, be the case that her rights were being violated. Whereas in fact, given the kind of statist system that we have, um, the capitalist can just bribe legislators and or get courts to sort of override property rights or confiscate the old lady's property and, and give her quote unquote just compensation through eminent domain. This is just one example. I mean, he spins out a, a whole system of this basically. And then I guess the, the final person to mention is Hans Hermann Hoppe, who was a, a student of Murray Rothbard. And although he, he agreed with Rothbard's general uh, political conclusions that there shouldn't be a state, the state is in fact the, the primary violator of property rights and not the, the guarantor of property rights that just, you know, just by, by virtue of the fact of taxation alone, it violates property. He agreed with all of that. But he didn't. He didn't have the the kind of natural rights approach to self ownership that um, that Rothbard had. Hoppe takes a very different approach, um, and this is this is a controversial argument. But basically, he he uses what he calls arg argumentation ethics to establish the principle of self ownership. And as far as I can understand him, he's basically saying this: if you agree to engage in argumentation at all then you have agreed to abide by the rules of rational discourse. That is, you and I um, put forward propositions and counter propositions in an attempt to argue some point. And because we've agreed to do this, we've agreed to resolve whatever disagreement we may have by reference to the principles of, of reason, of rationality. We've agreed to abide by those. And because we've agreed to abide by those, we've also implicitly agreed not to violently attack each other as a result of our disagreement. We've agreed by engaging in argument at all that it will be reason that settles the dispute and not force. And he concludes from this that this um, implicitly recognizes the existence of self-ownership and that to argue against self-ownership therefore is a performative contradiction. Like you, you can't make the argument that you can't argue as, as he puts it. Now, as I say, I'm not totally sure whether this argument works or not, even if you adopt a kind of teleological conception of what an argument is, that is that it's not just a, a sort of arbitrary spewing forth of propositions, but rather that it's a, a sequence of propositions designed to aim at the attainment of some, some truth. So you have like a teleological conception of argumentation that way. Even if you do that, um, it's not totally clear to me that this um, 
enables you uncontroversially to arrive at the principle of self-ownership. I mean, for example, uh, let's say that I, um, I have a slave, but I agree for the duration of, say, one hour to a- allow the slave to freely engage in debate with me. And so he can freely put forward whichever propositions he wants. And for the duration of that hour, I won't uh, physically attack him or do anything to him. And I've acknowledged that I will abide by the rules of debate for that hour. Uh, but then the hour expires and I no longer abide by those rules. I, I don't see an inherent uh, contradiction in that. So I don't know that I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's an interesting argument that Hoppe puts forward. I'm just not totally sure that I'm convinced of it. Uh, but yeah, that that basically gives you a sort of broad overview, I think. Yeah, very nice, very nice. I'm not convinced by that argument either. I think the fact that we come to the table for discourse does have implications, but I I couldn't say that self-ownership is a necessary one. Um, All right, well, I think we've given a pretty uh, extensive overview. If you've watched all three of these videos, uh, you're basically up to speed on uh, the development of liberalism. And I'm noticing there are you know, there have been obviously in the last 10, 12 years since Ron Paul, uh, internet libertarians that are very active, very prominent. Um, but particularly in the last year, I'm seeing a, an uptick in libertarian talking points. Again, maybe many uh, prominent YouTube, YouTube personalities identify themselves as liberals. Um, I've been seeing some stuff from Mike Malice, who seems to be an anarchist thinker, uh, obviously sticks hex and hammers, a libertarian. Uh, JF is still a libertarian. Ivan is still a libertarian. Um, I used to identify as one. So what is what accounts for this renaissance? I guess that's the last thing to to point to the the Internet anarchist, Internet libertarian phenomenon of, you know, the last couple decades. Um, what how do you account for that? Is it the the kind of people who were involved in, in tech, the early adopters, the entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurs? Is it a personality type that was drawn into internet discourse? And so we saw a kind of skew towards libertarian ideas ideologically, or, or why have why have we seen this resurgence of uh, classical liberal thought lately? One reason might be just the general erosion of of trust in political authority overall. You know, um, it's certainly because of the internet. It's become increasingly difficult for um, for politicians and for I guess you could say the cathedral more generally to hold uh, a tight control over the narrative, so to speak. And it's becoming increasingly easier, even with the efforts of big tech firms to try and clamp down on alternative uh, sources of information. It's becoming increasingly easier to get uh, contrary narratives. And so more and more people are coming to understand, you know, just what liars these people are. And when they come to understand that, they naturally begin, I think, to grope around for explanations of how they came to their predicament and the kind of libertarian slash anarcho-capitalist analysis of the state, which says that, you know, the state is basically a gang of thieves writ large, a major criminal organization carrying out its behavior under cover of law. Um, this uh, this explains a lot of that, and it, it certainly clarifies a lot of what we see. So it might have some, so I think there's, there's definitely some, um, some uh, you know explanation of uh, of its kind of uh, the kind of growth and influence and resurgence of libertarian ideas in that way that it can just kind of provide an explanation of this general predicament. Another thing is that as society now comes to splinter into different narrative camps, and it just becomes increasingly evident that people from these different camps cannot uh, really live together peacefully in any kind of society. Um, the libertarian proposal, which I'm certainly 100 uh, percent behind, that we should just, you know, amicably separate and, and split off so that we don't have to be at each other's throats all the time. And the left can have its own country and the, the right can have its own country. Um, this 
I think is starting to become an increasingly uh, appealing idea to many people and more people are finally coming around to the idea uh, that it's um, not only a good idea, but but may even be necessary. It may even be the only viable option in the long term. Um, as far as personality types, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's definitely something to the idea that um, a certain personality type is attracted to, to libertarian ideas in particular. I mean, the writings of people like Murray Rothbard or Robert Nozick, they're very intellectually dense. They're very, um, it, it, they have a very kind of step-by-step -step logical structure to them. And people who are interested in ideas and interested in that type of thinking are naturally going to be attracted to that. Now, I understand that that's not most people, but, you know, among those who become interested in libertarian ideas at the high level, there's always the, the option to sort of dumb things down, popularize them, percolate them downwards and toward uh, what Hayek called secondhand dealers in ideas, which I think is a great term. Um, and, you know, that's, that's going on slowly through organizations like the Mises Institute through some of these other YouTubers. Uh, Dave Smith is another one that could be mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is just a general symptom of the coming apart of society and of the increasing difficulty of the political class to maintain a single coherent narrative. I think that's sort of the most general explanation of it. Yes, I agree. Uh, those are some of the causes. So uh, one, I guess, one final question. Um, is there developing any libertarian response in terms of economic theory or like kind of viable real political theory to confront the rise of mixed economies like China? Um, like what, what do libertarians today even have to say about the rise of China and, you know, obviously protectionism under Donald Trump came back to the fore. Uh, many people who had been leaning libertarian got behind uh, this kind of um, what well, Listian economic uh, philosophy, Friedrich List being a German economist in the mid to late 1800s, his ideas were influential in America. Uh, he was also influenced by American political thought. But anyway, uh, more of a national system of political economy has been uh, increasingly appealing in light of this kind of geopolitical competition. Um, so what have you seen any intelligent libertarian responses advocating why we might expect that if we go further towards a laissez-faire direction and less protectionism that we actually would become more competitive with China. Who, who's making these arguments? Um, well, I mean, I, I actually don't know of anyone specifically making it from a libertarian perspective explicitly. I mean, I'm sure there are people who are, but um, there are sources that you can clip information from and try to sort of construct an argument to that effect. Now, this is an important question that you just asked, and I don't know how much time I'm going to have to go into the proper detail that um, a, a comprehensive answer would require. But basically, in, in broad terms, the first thing to realize is that when one looks at sort of pure economic theory and its analysis of really anything, but in particular an issue like international trade or or something of that sort. Um, normally when one points to an empirical example, like the rise of China, and alleges that as a, a counterexample to the, to the theoretical analysis, um, there's a kind of methodological issue that, that comes up here. This is, this is going to be very autistic, but, uh, you know, bear with me. This is, I, I, I insist this is a bit important if we, if we want to really drill down to the bottom of it. Basically, um, in the Austrian conception, economic theory is a priori. It's not an empirical uh, science. Um, there are certain axioms to the system that sort of construct and constrict the, the universe of all empirical possibilities. And although empirical reality uh, cannot falsify the theory, it is, not some, it is not something which is in the business of generating uh, predictions. And indeed, if, if one wishes to examine particular empirical episodes, uh, 
in order to to make a case for this or that in the realm of economics, one cannot even select relevant empirical episodes unless one already has some sort of a theoretical uh, background to work with. So for example, um, suppose, uh, let, me, let me think of an example here. Uh, suppose that um, there's an increase in the minimum wage law, right? And now normally when you, standard economic theory predicts that there will be some amount of unemployment resulting from this. Now a kind of naive sort of knee jerk response to this would be, well, here's, an, here's a case empirically where the minimum wage law was increased and uh, unemployment did not spike. Uh, ha ha, you know, uh, economics uh, BTFO. Okay, uh, well, th there's a number of things here. First, the the claims made in economics about the relationships between various phenomena are always made with the ca uh, caveat that all other things are to be held equal. Um, and of course, in actually existing empirical situations, this is virtually never the case. The, the, the ceteris paribus clause is an intellectual device that enables us to sort of separate for purposes of theoretical analysis various, um, various aspects of what's going on so that we can trace causal links together. Um, I, I guess an analogy of this would be like um, in standard Newtonian physics, how um, air resistance is ignored. Now, that doesn't mean that air resistance isn't a real thing. It's just that in order to intellectually isolate the proper aspects of what causes what, and to use that theory as an explanation, we have to do these kind of mental isolations. And so if you examine a concrete case of uh, a place where they, let's say, increase the minimum wage law and unemployment didn't spike, well, you have to examine certain particular aspects of that area. Um, what sort of what sort of workers are there? What's what sort of skill level is present? Uh, you know, any any number of factors that are local to that area. Whereas the general economic claim is a kind of general statement about relationships. So it's not a simple matter of kind of looking at something and saying, ha ha, you know, this has been refuted. You really have to get into the weeds and into the specifics. And the same would be true for, uh, you know, for example, the rise of China. Um, if one wishes to talk about what's been going on in China, it's also important that one has reliable uh, empirical information. And this is something that, you know, one can also engage in some pretty significant argument about. To what degree is what one hears about China these days the reality of what's going on in China? And to what degree is it, um, is it something that the CCP projects to the outside world and wants you to believe about it? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example of something that I um, I heard not too long ago. And forgive me if my memory is a bit fuzzy on, on the details. But basically, in Chinese society for a long time, there there have been basically two kinds of university education that one might have. And these two types correspond broadly to our distinction between going to a trade school and having a kind of standard liberal arts education. Now, those who go into the latter area, who have the latter type of education, they tended to be accorded a great deal of social prestige and they tended to have government jobs. And while things were going well, they, uh, you know, they they lived well and were prosperous and had, uh, you know, a great deal of respect, social prestige and so forth. But conversely, uh, those who went to trade schools or worked at, at like manual jobs tended to be denigrated by the general society, a sort of low class, uneducated, you know, kind of kind of bumpkins, kind of stupid people, you know, that sort of thing. And this uh, this fact, this uh, general social attitude was encouraged by the CCP for a long time. Now, of course, as you might expect, this began to have consequences. Families began more and more to urge their children to pursue these kind of more standard government job oriented liberal arts types of educations and therefore tended to discourage them from going into manual work, from going into manufacturing. And this shift began to have consequences because China, as you know, has adopted as, as a significant uh, 
part of its rise, uh, the identity of the factory of the world. And so if you have workers shifting out of this area because it's it's something that's socially denigrated, this is going to have consequences for China's position in this area. The CCP came to realize this and then began scrambling to try and reverse that propaganda and emit outwards the opposite propaganda. And this tends to be uh, this tends to be a feature of the CCP's operation in general, that they tend to advocate some sort of policy and then unforeseen consequences follow from that policy. And then the CCP starts scrambling to reverse itself. This is a this is a repeated pattern. Uh, but as I say, this is an empirical question and it, it would require you to really dive into the weeds and really examine this in detail. There is one, uh, there's one YouTube channel that I'd suggest if you're interested in this information. It's a pretty big channel. Uh, Lao Y86. Uh, uh, and he is, he's an, uh, he's American who lived in China for 10 years, but returned a couple of years ago after the rise of uh, Xi Jinping, as China began to take a more authoritarian uh, turn. And he speaks, uh, he speaks Mandarin fluently and, and is able to, sort of report on what the CCP is doing. And uh, a lot of what he says really throws cold water on what, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has been proclaiming about itself. And it's sort of a useful counterbalance to all of this uh, China boosting that we're hearing. But as I say, this is a very complicated question and it's an empirical question. I would just say in a nutshell that I think if you if you really examined all of the empirical evidence, uh, we don't have the kind of blatant contra contradiction of what an Austrian or a libertarian would say would be the consequences of a mixed economy that China makes it seem like we have. That there are some serious structural problems within Chinese society, but that for its own personal reasons, the CCP uh, chooses not to emphasize this. Okay, well, we're stepping our toes into the water of that debate that will have to happen next time. Uh, for the moment, I was mostly just looking for uh, what the libertarian policy prescriptions would be vis-a-vis -vis, uh, international trade imbalances and the problems that we at least seem to have with China. Now, my opinion on China, I saw the opening to the Beijing, uh, Beijing Olympics and I'm a Chinese China respecter. Regardless, I think they obviously have something going on. Uh, so we can get into that next time. But uh, policy prescriptions regarding trade imbalances and some of like let let's just address this issue now, and then we can continue the rest of the debate later. But like List's argument is basically that if you follow the the route of comparative advantage and you know say your your country is really good at producing linen but you're not good at producing muskets well you can produce all the linen you want but if your neighbor is the only one producing muskets that's going to be a problem for you eventually you know these sorts of arguments for you know why you would want to uh you know, not go with the the kind of pure market incentives for the structure of your economy. Why you you might want even want to subsidize certain industries that are integral for the you know building up a, a defense industry. You know, like we do with our defense contractors. Um, and then, yeah, what what do you do about trade imbalances? What is the contemporary libertarian uh, policy prescription? regarding those sorts of problems. China just being kind of the uh, the archetypal other to to consider when thinking about these sorts of geostrategic economic uh, decisions, policies. Okay. Uh, well, just to, to go back to the example, uh, country A produces linen very well, uh, country B uh, produces muskets. Well, uh, there would there would be consequences for country B, the musket producing country to simply withdraw from international trade. Um, it wouldn't have linen or presumably, you know, some other things that it's not as good at producing. Now, if the country B, because it produces muskets, let's say, wants to um, emphasize strongly this kind of, uh, you know, martial aspect of its existence and become basically a, a garrison state. Um, it may well go out and begin attempting to conquer other people. 
But remember that at least in, in modern industrialized societies, you have to have a strong base of wealth in order to even be able to effectively engage in conquest because wars cost a lot of money. Uh, and if you divert a lot of your economic production to war, that's going to have consequences eventually. Not right away, not immediately. It may, you know, may take some time. And, uh, but uh, you will impoverish your citizens inevitably, or at least you know, relatively speaking, if you devote too much of your work to, to warfare. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess also I would, I would contest the, the specificity of the example of, let's say, linen and muskets, because there are other things that, you know, there are all sorts of things that go into the production of, of muskets, you know, iron, wood, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. So couldn't you disaggregate the musket and sort of engage in international trade in a more roundabout way where you sort of acquire the individual components and then have them be arranged? I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, there's there's more than one way to get a musket, in other words. And, you know, it, it, as I say, I mean, this is this is a sort of complex arrangement here. So I couldn't um, I couldn't tell you with any certainty uh, exactly how um, any given thing uh, would, you know, anything would result from from a given, uh, you know, international trade arrangement. But basically, I mean, what I can tell you in general is that trade barriers like tariffs, I, I mean, I, I once um, I, I heard Trump specifically make this point at one point um, where he said um, that if he imposes tariffs on Chinese goods, he's going to be taxing the Chinese. No, no, he isn't. It's not the Chinese that pay the tax. It's it's American consumers that pay it. Um, the one of one of the reasons why I oppose tariff barriers is that among those who advocate them, they tend to be presented as a means by which one nation can protect its own domestic industry uh, against the foreign equivalent of whatever that industry is. So let's say you, let's say as a kind of protectionism, you uh, impose restrictions on Chinese doctors being able to immigrate to the United States and thereby protect the American medical industry, let's say. Uh, and you do this uh, by basically, allegedly um, making sort of Chinese doctors pay more by not being, you know, exposed or having access to better markets. In fact, what's going on is that you are extracting wealth from American non-doctors and placing it into the hands of doctors, because uh, su supposedly if Chinese uh, doctors want to move to the United States, there's a better market for them there. And if American consumers are willing to accept them, um, they they at least believe that they can get cheaper medical services that way. So by preventing this, you're imposing more ex higher medical costs on American consumers. So it's really a, a a redistribution of wealth within America that's going on. That's what um, that's what tariff barriers do. It's not it's not an extraction of wealth from a foreign country into the domestic uh, into the domestic sphere. Um, th this is this is an argument I've heard pretty often among uh, those who favor protectionism. But protectionism is basically redistribution within a country from the the protected group to those within the country who are not part of the protected group. So it's a kind of it's a kind of coerced redistribution. Uh, let's see. Now, as far as I mean, I understand the implication that you're getting at that if, let's say, China produces weapons. Uh, then it will just conquer everybody. But again, I make the point that if uh, China is good at producing weapons and say terrible at producing other things, this will have consequences for China's general economic stability, especially if it chooses to engage in more war. So the consequences of, of that behavior will be felt and they will impact China negatively uh, eventually, just not right away. So I'd appeal to that you know, Bastiat's distinction of the, the seen and the unseen. And uh, I mean, I, I understand that uh, emotionally this may be a, a difficult argument for people to uh, accept because it involves having to kind of abstract away into the future or think about hypotheticals, whereas what you in fact do see is, is this uh, amassing Chinese military presence. 
But uh, I mean, my answer would be, you know, just just wait. I mean, there are internal problems within the Chinese economy and they will manifest themselves sooner or later if they continue the course that they're on. OK, well, predictably, the libertarian policy prescription is wait, <laughs> don't do anything. Um, OK, all right. Well, that's fair enough. Um, obviously, we could get into the back and forth there because there's a lot to discuss on those topics. And that's kind of the, the modern, uh, you know, the modern discourse surrounding libertarianism, protectionism. Some of those figures that I mentioned talk about this sort of thing often. And I think it's one of the, the most important issues of our time. Um, either we reformulate into some new form of liberalism that you know corrects the kind of crony capitalism that we're currently under or we move towards it looks like a more authoritarian china style system uh since most people in the west i think right now believe that china is a threat and they are in the ascendance compared to western societies but we'll have to leave that for next time to actually have that discussion out so it was uh, a pleasure speaking with you thank you for the information as always uh, any last points before we wrap up? Um, I think everything's been covered pretty well. Uh, I, I hope the um, the explanations I gave about um, you know the Austrian economic uh, theories and the other ideas and all that was was clear because I know there was a lot of stuff that I went through, but I seem to have kept it all contained in my head. But just because it's clear to me doesn't necessarily mean it's clear to someone else who was listening. So I I hope it was. And uh, if it wasn't and anyone has any questions, I will, as is my usual want, be lurking in the comments section and will answer people who have questions about things. OK, well, you're truly benevolent, Ivan. Appreciate it. Um, and we'll meet up in a couple weeks, probably for the, the debate on liberalism. And that will be fun. Um, if I can get an internet connection set up out here before then, hopefully we can live stream it. I would really like to do that. If my internet connection is coming soon, I might just hold off so that we can do it live. But uh, in any case, until then, thank you guys for listening and take care.